Hi everybody and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to be talking about two very popular diets for hydrogen sulfide overgrowth or hydrogen sulfide SIBO, the low sulfur diet and the low FODMAP diet. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of each and which one you should ultimately be doing if you have hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. All right, first and foremost, I do want to mention that I have a whole other video about how to actually diagnose hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. We talk about breath testing, stool testing, and I hope that that's going to provide a lot of clarity. So if you're kind of on the fence, if you're not sure if you have this, or if you've been told that you have hydrogen sulfide overgrowth and you just want to um, double check or verify that diagnosis, go ahead over to the other video. In the meantime, assuming that you know for sure this is something that you're dealing with, let's get into these two popular diets and some of the reasoning of why they come up. So the low sulfur diet, this is probably fairly intuitive, but I'll talk about it anyway. The idea here is that hydrogen sulfide is H2S. So hydrogen can come from any number of sources, but there are bacteria making hydrogen in your gut and they're, the hydrogen sulfide producers are theoretically gonna gobble that up to get the H2 needed for this equation. But where does the sulfur come from, right? Like you need the sulfur if you're gonna make hydrogen sulfide. So the idea with restricting, the, or restricting sulfur in your diet or doing a low sulfur diet is that you will be getting rid of the sulfur in this equation. Therefore, the bacteria can't produce the hydrogen sulfide anymore. We're gonna talk about why that may not be the case, at least to the degree that we are speculating it is. But that's the rationale for that diet. And then of course we have the low FODMAP diet, the queen of all SIBO diets, at least currently in 2022, it still is. And you see this being used for one of two reasons. If you follow Monash University and the actual intent behind the diet and its development and the bulk of the research, actually not even the bulk, like the vast, 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 vast majority of the research on low FODMAP, they will tell you that it is for symptom management. It's not getting to the root cause, there's never been a single paper as of 2020, or I'm sorry, as of 2022, brain slip, that demonstrates that the low FODMAP diet or any diet can effectively starve the SIBO. So we don't know that that's a thing that happens. I hypothesize that it is not happening, but one group will say it's for symptomatic management and they don't even talk about the starving the SIBO idea. The other camp will say that you have to starve the SIBO with the low FODMAP diet. Again, this has never been demonstrated in studies. I think what is much more likely is that we are using it as a symptomatic band-aid and it helps you feel better because there's less distension and less pressure in your, in your intestines and that's why you feel better. It's not because you're actually starving the bacteria. But that, that kind of segues into my next point is that we tend to think of the bacteria eating the food that we provide for them, but I'm here to tell you the bacteria are much more crafty than that. They're much more resilient than that and they have a great deal of metabolic flexibility, meaning you, you, and you probably have done this in your life. You can swing from one diet to another and your microbiome is still there. They're still going to be digesting that food. So no matter what, if you go from raw vegan to carnivore, man, that would be whiplash, wouldn't it? To keto, to paleo, to AIP, to I don't know, whatever else, fruititarian, you could do any number of diets and you're not gonna kill off all the microbes in your gut. You might traumatize them a bit, but you're not gonna kill off a lot of the bacteria in the gut. They will be flexible and resilient and eat whatever they are given. But as is the case with hydrogen sulfide, we have to think of where the sulfur is coming from. And yes, there is, prepare for very ugly doodles, by the way. There is some amount that's gonna come in from your food. So let's say, uh, uh, does that look like a steak? That's maybe a little bit too penisy to be a T-bone. Whatever, deal with it. So some of the sulfur is gonna come from things like steak, uh, beef and lamb, just broadly, eggs, dairy, food-based sulfur. You also have this thing called a liver and you have its compadre, the gallbladder. Eh. Again, the art is not spectacular today. I don't know what to tell you. And when you release bile with all of your meals, particularly higher fat meals, bile has an awful lot of taurine in it, and that is a sulfur-containing amino acid. So we have a lot of sulfur in our bile that we're releasing every day. And if you take things like ox bile supplements, that would also have um, some, some sulfur in it as well. Also, this mucus layer that I drew for you, all of this nice green network underneath the microbiome, 
that there is a fence between your microbes and you, the intestinal epithelial cells. This whole thing is made out of sulfur and like carbs and protein, basically. But there's a lot of disulfide bonds that are holding it together, those glycoproteins. So there's an awful lot of sulfur in here. And then there's another thing that I won't really get into today, but basically if your immune system, which I'll just draw an immune cell over here, I guess, if your immune system is particularly agitated or you're particularly inflamed, your gut epithelium can make another compound that is high in sulfur. So believe it or not, just chronic inflammation can drive this to a certain degree as well. But I would say that for the purposes of our talk, the first thing is that yes, sulfur from the diet is going to provide some of the fuel. Also, so is bile. And we know that bile is important. Bile actually has antimicrobial properties. It helps stimulate motility. Bile is a good thing. It's not that we need to get rid of all of the bile sources, but it's almost a little bit silly to think that if we just get rid of one of the four sources of sulfur, that that's gonna make a notable dent in the hydrogen sulfide production, right? Cause like you still have the other sources, but the two biggest ones I think for most of us are gonna be bile and this, this huge bed of, of disulfide bonds that we have in the mucus layer. So A, your bacteria are very resourceful. They have plenty of food. They have plenty of sulfur at their disposal at all times. So robbing them of sulfur in the diet is only gonna do so much good. Now I will say I have used a low sulfur diet, but it's not for the reasons you might be thinking. Most of the people who watch this channel, to the best of my knowledge, have IBS or SIBO, or they hypothesize they have SIBO, or they have some type of dysbiosis. But the way that I've used the low sulfur diet a handful of times is for people with ulcerative colitis. There's some research that suggests people with UC have a particularly high amount of hydrogen sulfide producing organisms in their colon. And I've had patients where they're in an acute flare, something came up, something happened, and they are just miserable with mucousy, bloody diarrhea, and it's either restrict sulfur and, and try to band-aid something naturally, or they might need to go to the ER or the hospital. So a couple of times I've helped somebody get out of a flare, sometimes with the addition of drugs, sometimes not, but I've, I've seen this help people with UC when they're in a really nasty flare and nothing else is working, where restricting dietary sulfur coming in for like a couple of weeks has been helpful for them. But notice that I said for a couple of weeks, this is not something to be used long-term. It's not something that you want to do for more than a week or two because, and we can do a whole nother video on this down the road if, if you think this is something that you would like to learn, but we need sulfur for a lot of stuff in the body. We need it to make bile. We need it to detoxify. We need it to make glutathione, which is the main antioxidant in our body. And it helps keep our immune system happy and healthy and not inflamed. So if you want to fight inflammation and if you want to combat things like autoimmunity and you want your immune system to do a good job protecting you while also not going bananas at everything it comes in contact with, you really, really, really need sulfur. So please do not restrict sulfur for hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. Again, unless it's particularly overgrown. Again, I've seen this on stool testing on occasion, like it can be pretty bad. But for 99% of you, I do not recommend restricting sulfur. A, because it probably won't make a notable dent in the total sulfur that these organisms have available to them. And B, you need sulfur for other things in your body. And for that matter, we do need hydrogen sulfide. This is very much like any other conversation, whether it's methane or candida. The goal is not to get down to zero. Hydrogen sulfide has a lot of really surprising protective effects in the body. So we don't want to totally obliterate it. We just want it at a level that your body can handle that's not flaming you out perpetually. So low sulfur diet, A, I don't know if it's going to make that profound of a difference for a lot of you, but B, these bacteria have a lot of sulfur at their disposal anyway. If, again, speaking to the 1% of you, maybe, if you're watching this and you do have ulcerative colitis and you're like, man, lady, this would be really good to know if I have a flare, the basis of the low sulfur diet that I recommend is just reduce or cut out for again, a week or two, red meat, so beef, lamb, stuff like that, um, eggs, dairy, that's it. That's really all I have people restrict. I don't have you bother with other animal proteins. 
I don't have you bother cutting out things like the brassica vegetables. I really don't think that those are going to make a huge difference. Even though, yes, onion and garlic are high sulfur, and yes, the brassica vegetables are high sulfur, they're not nearly as high as those foods that I just rattled off. So if anything, maybe a temporary shift to a more plant-based diet could be beneficial. All right, that being said, I realize some of you are probably bummed and confused as ever, but I have more stuff to tell you about and probably bum you out with. Let's get on to low FODMAP. So again, mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is actually a controversial topic when you get into the research and you get out of like the Facebook forums and the functional medicine offices. There's never been a single study that shows that we can starve the SIBO with the low FODMAP diet. All of the research that I've ever seen on this diet and all of the information coming out of Monash is saying that it's a symptomatic band-aid and it's helping to reduce some of the distension and the pain and the visceral hypersensitivity that we see with IBS. But going back to the hydrogen sulfide thing, right? Because like you're all watching this video because of this topic. So maybe you're saying, all right, lady, but like those people didn't have hydrogen sulfide SIBO. Or okay, lady, but we only started testing for hydrogen sulfide SIBO in the last like five years. What about the hydrogen sulfide topic? There is a little bit of evidence. I mean, like two papers that I could point you to, and I'm going to link them down below in the comments or the first comment or the description or something. Um, there was one study that demonstrated that a low FODMAP diet significantly increased the number of hydrogen sulfide producing organisms. There's another paper that I'll direct you to where they showed that uh, they compared a low brassica diet. So this is things like cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, that sort of stuff. Um, a, they compared a low versus a high brassica diet, and they showed that the low brassica diet increased hydrogen sulfide producing organisms and eating more brassica high sulfur cruciferous vegetables lowered the hydrogen sulfide producers. So we have two studies that are showing that probably low FODMAP is not going to make a lot of sense in the context of hydrogen sulfide specifically. Now, again, we've only been researching hydrogen sulfide SIBO for a relatively short period of time. Really, the low FODMAP diet is still very new. It's only about 15 years, eh, yeah, 10, 10, 15 years old at this point. So it's all still pretty new. But the research that we do have suggests that it's not going to positively impact these guys and it might actually make it worse. And I have noticed that with my patients where the people who have restricted their diet the most severely for the longest tend to be the most sick and it's the hardest to treat. So if you're listening to this now and maybe you just started one of these diets and <laughs> I don't want to sound dramatic, but like it's not too late for you, please consider adding some of these foods back in your diet or at least being open-minded to it. Again, like with low FODMAP, the, all the Monash materials say that you're supposed to start the reintroduction phase after about six weeks. And they also say that if you didn't have a notable symptomatic improvement going on low FODMAP, that after about, I think, four to six weeks, they tell you in their training materials to abandon that diet. Like if somebody is not responsive to low FODMAP diet, don't keep doing the low FODMAP diet. Find something else that you can help counsel them in if you're in a nutritionist or a dietetic world. So even the people who develop low FODMAP say, if you don't get a symptomatic improvement from it, don't do it. Um, but there was one other I want to point out too, and I want to mention, sorry, I'm kind of babbling this, this uh, video. Um, remember how I was talking about like all these different sources of hydrogen sulfide? Well, what we didn't necessarily talk about is this idea that I think is, is probably going to be demonstrated in research still, but this idea that the more good bacteria you have, the more you're going to inhibit the bad guys. We've seen this with a lot of other things ranging from GI infections to candida. We know this happens in the gut. The more you nurture and feed the good bacteria, the more they're going to pump the brakes on the bad guys and they're going to inhibit the bad guys. So if you think about it, FODMAP foods are all prebiotic. They help feed the good bacteria, particularly Fecalobacterium presidentiae and Bifidobacterium, two of the really important keystone species or genuses in the gut. So it stands to reason that feeding them extra FODMAPs and feeding them extra brassica vegetables would help them grow so that they can inhibit these bad guys that we want to get rid of. 
Again, we've seen this with other GI, GI stuff over the years, so it stands to reason it would happen here too. Similarly, there was a study, oh gosh, I don't remember how old it is. It's a couple years old at least, but there was at least one study where they had, uh, they added fructo oligosaccharides, so like inulin, into the diet, and they showed that that reduces hydrogen sulfide organisms as well. So it goes back to feed your good bacteria an abundance and a diversity of healthy fiber sources and high FODMAP foods, if you can tolerate them. Maybe don't overdo it on the steak and the eggs and the cheese and stuff. I actually worry a lot about people who are doing carnivore and to a lesser extent, but still significant extent, keto. Because I've seen people who say they're doing keto and they eat two pounds of cheese a day. I've seen people who have done carnivore and they have pooped three times in three months. So I really wonder about the shifts that we're getting when we are pouring a lot of sulfur into the diet and saturated fat and bile. Um, if anything, if you're looking for some direction, dietarily speaking, from the hydrogen sulfide perspective, I would say consider doing more plant-based recipes. I don't think you have to go vegan. I don't think you have to be completely plant-based, but consider making more plant-based recipes and incorporating more FODMAPs into your diet, not fewer. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening right until the end. If you're here, I'm sorry, I probably traumatized you with this one because you are probably thinking, yes, she's going to tell me one of these diets is going to work for me. Hurrah. In the next video, I'm going to do a, a shorter video about the ideal diet for treating hydrogen sulfide. But again, I already put a couple of the little ditties in here. Lots of plant foods, lots of diversity, lots of fiber, lots of FODMAPs if you could tolerate them, and maybe whittle down the steak and the eggs and the dairy and the lamb and stuff like that that's super, super high sulfur for a short period of time if you do think that it's bothering you. But guys, thank you so much for listening. I will see you in the next video about hydrogen sulfide. Stay tuned. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.